first and foremost thought on Donald Trump. If he becomes president, it's not only bad for stuff like climate policy. It's not only bad for stuff like corporate regulation, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Donald Trump winning, in my view, would significantly strengthen the corporate aligned politicians, media outlets, and consultants that currently control the Democratic Party. The same class of people who obstruct progress on everything. It would so significantly strengthen the Democratic Party leadership, Donald Trump winning, that it's not actually insane to believe that that Democratic Party leadership in some ways wants Donald Trump to win, or at least would be absolutely fine with Donald Trump winning. So you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, how does Donald Trump winning strengthen the corporate masters of the Democratic Party? Because it would reimpose the rhetorical parameters that those Democratic Party bosses want. They want a discourse that is purely anti-Trump all the time, a discourse that exclusively focuses on Trump's outbursts and insanity and crimes, a discourse that marginalizes all other topics as some sort of distraction from the central cause of opposing Donald Trump. They want a discourse that casts all pressure on the Democratic Party, not just as a distraction, but as traitorous allyship with Donald Trump. That's what the Democratic Party leadership wants. A Trump victory in November gives the current Democratic Party leadership exactly those rhetorical conditions which allow them to further suppress all pressure on the Democratic Party itself. So if you want to help the corporate center of the Democratic Party, the corrupt corporate aligned leaders of the current Democratic Party, if you want to help them, it seems to me your choice in this election is very clear. Vote for Donald Trump. Now, Biden. Let me start by saying that I literally ran the part of Bernie Sanders' 2020 campaign that focused on spotlighting the terrible parts of Joe Biden's record. That was literally my job every day for two years. So I know all of the reasons why people are not excited to vote for Joe Biden. I'm like the top one-tenth of one one percent of people who understand what Joe Biden is and certainly the bad side of his record. So if you're going to come in here and say, oh, you know, Sirota, you know, you, you don't really understand how bad Biden is. I spent two fucking years of my life. Every single hour of every single day focusing on that. So I know very well the downsides of Joe Biden's record. So here's my take on Biden. He has laid out and enacted the best economic policies of any president in 50 years, which isn't saying much considering the competition, but actually is a true statement. When you look at the American Rescue Plan, parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, the actions of the FTC, the CFPB, this is not a debatable point. It's a, it's a fact. I don't care how much you hate Joe Biden or how you're going to vote. Again, vote however you want. That's your business. But this administration has produced the best economic policy we've seen in 50 years, which isn't to say that people are ingrates because they're unhappy with the economy. Two things can be true at the same time. The current president's economic policies can be better than any in the last 50 years, which may not be saying much again because of the past presidents haven't been that great. That can be true. And people are understandably unhappy with, the, with America's persis persistently dystopian economy. Two things can be true at the same time. I'm not one of those people who say, you know, people complaining about the economy are ingrates. But let me also say, I completely understand why people are so mad at Biden. He's done some pretty terrible things like not doing more, not using more political capital to pass a minimum wage increase, not doing more to reauthorize the child tax credit, letting the American Rescue Plan uh, expire, and obviously refusing to do anything to halt the violence in Gaza. But again, I'm not here to tell you how to vote. Do whatever you want. But I will offer this. Just as Trump winning is the most helpful possible thing to the corporate center of the Democratic Party, a Biden win will almost certainly weaken that corporate center of the Democratic Party. Now, again, I know what you're thinking. Wait, wait, wait. wait. How does voting for the corporate center of the Democratic Party, their candidate, weaken those same people? It's because of Biden's age and his incredibly weak vice president. 
because he is so old and because his vice president is obviously not a shoe in successor, Biden is instantly a lame duck president the day after the election. And his entire White House staff is similarly a lame duck staff. Just as important, the day after a Biden win in 2024 is the first day of the 2028 Democratic presidential primary. And the corporate bosses who run the Democratic Party no longer have their boogeyman to suppress the party's internal debate. They can no longer cite Donald Trump as a reason that everyone should fall in line behind their hand-picked candidate. They will no longer be able to argue that there shouldn't be any kind of vigorous intra-party fight for the direction of the party. And not only will they not be able to argue that, there will be that contest because of the 2028 Democratic primary, because it will be an open field. Unlike, say, Al Gore in 2000, Kamala Harris is not a strong enough vice president to be able to effectively clear the field. There are going to be a lot of candidates vying for the presidency and the Democratic nomination. And here's the thing. They will be competing with each other to court various factions of the Democratic Party, including the party's progressive base. If you hate the corporate center of the Democratic Party and want to finally weaken its grip on power, that's the kind of competition you should want. It's the kind of competition that will almost certainly happen if Biden is reelected, but that almost certainly will not happen if Donald Trump is president and Democratic Party party bosses can suppress such a fight by saying that it allegedly weakens the party and undermines the necessary fight against Trump. Now, of course, I can, I can already hear some people saying, well, Sirota is saying we should reward Joe Biden's bad policies with our vote. And by doing that, we tell the Democratic Party that there's no price to be paid for their broken promise. That argument or, or that kind of argument, it's, it's, it's like saying you, you have to punish the party to get the party to respond to you. I'd like to believe that's the way politics works. I really would. But sorry, that's not the way politics works. Being blamed for an election loss tends to marginalize an agenda even further. In my opinion, what can actually change a party's overall direction, what we've actually seen happen in history, not some theory, is, is that a vigorous internal party battle can end up changing the whole direction of the institution. And that kind of battle can only happen if there's not an outside boogeyman like Donald Trump for the cynical, corrupt, corporate aligned leaders of today's Democratic Party to be able to cite that boogeyman to shut down the discourse. So that's my basic take on this election and how to think about electoral outcomes. I Again, I'm not telling people how to vote. I'm just saying the two premises are Donald Trump wins is the best night in the world for the corporate aligned center of the Democratic Party. Joe Biden winning, it is immediately the day after the start of the 2028 presidential race, the start of major politicians in the Democratic Party having to compete, aggressively competing to court different factions of the party, including the party's progressive wing. To me, that's the kind of competition you want. Sorry for a long-winded answer. No, I mean, I look, I think everything you said, well-spoken, I think you just spoke a lot of realities and truths. And like you said, you're coming from someone who's actually participated, not just in a campaign, in the pretty much very same campaign to unseat Joe Biden. And I think that when I look at this, there are just political realities we have to accept. There would always be sort of a perfect world scenario. And I think a lot of the way that you have to approach voting is, like you said, it is a tactic. So I, I'm seeing a, a couple questions right here that say, what if I live somewhere where I, my vote's automatically going to go one way or the other and I want to cast a symbolic vote of support? To kind of double down on what you said I don't think either of us are in here trying to convince anybody to vote one way or the other. You vote however you want. If that's if if it's on your conscience and you say I just cannot bring myself to vote for this person, that's your right. That's your right as an American. You don't have to tell anybody about that. I'm not certainly going to say you should or shouldn't do this. I'm not here to scold you. What I will say is that if you believe in certain political outcomes and objectives and goals 
you have to necessarily look at this in a strategic sense. And that's not to, or, or know, actually, like, actually, I, I would, I, I, the other way to think about it is before you decide how to vote or whether to vote, I think you should start with what outcome do I want? Yeah. What's a realistic outcome that I not and not just like a any outcome that you want. What's a realistic outcome that you what's the best realistic outcome you think can come out of this election? And then yeah. from there you work backwards. Okay, well then how do how do I cast my vote? If if I think it's a realistic outcome uh that uh a third party can win. If, if you're genuinely, if you're being honest with yourself, you're not like pie in the skying it and you're saying, I think I think a third party can win. So I'm going to vote for a third party. Hey, no one can tell you you're right, right or wrong. I'm not telling you you're you're right or wrong. If you generally if you genuinely think the best possible outcome you can hope for is. Space to be cleared for there finally to be. An open seat Democratic presidential primary that causes a vigorous intra-party debate that may be able to force the uh, eventual nominee to be much better on policy, then I would suggest a, one way of thinking about that is that that's exactly what happens if Joe Biden wins because of his age, because his VP is, is so weak. I'm just saying, think first about the outcomes you want, be willing to be honest about what realistic outcomes are, and then from there, figure out how to how to vote, figure out how to engage politically in the election. Can I just jump in real quick, David, on the idea of outcomes? So the elephant in the room, I think, for many people who are listening right now, and I actually noting there is one questioner directly that I'm responding to, the issue of what is happening in Israel and Gaza right now, if you want to punish, uh, punish Joe Biden because of his policies, what I would say is you have to look at Joe Biden in comparison with other candidates. And so... For one thing, if you are comparing Joe Biden between Donald Trump and Robert F. Kennedy, Joe Biden, whether you like it or not, unfortunately probably has the more progressive side of that position. Robert F. Kennedy and Donald Trump seem to have both essentially endorsed exactly what is happening. They support Netanyahu's government. Trump has, of course, said, well, you know, I would end the war in one day. Nobody knows what that actually means. But that's, I think, one thing you have to consider when you think of political realities. The other thing with ID, the idea of voting third party is the same thing that I would say it is the political outcome. And so if you believe that a third party candidate is the person that can do the job, think that entire premise through. I think that, yes, there is an attraction to voting for a third party candidate because on a certain issue, they're saying what you want or rhetorically, they're saying what you want. But the reality is, is that being the president isn't just rhetorical and you have to think through is this person really going to be able to do the job that is going to get done and i'd be curious david when you worked on the sanders campaign that's probably something that you guys thought about when you thought about policy what are the political realities of what can actually get accomplished right you still have to go through a house you still have to go through a senate you have to go through limitations you will have to play politics but i think when i've said that before to people that is something that and I'm sure, like you said, I can hear people probably getting mad at me for saying this, but it was sort of like I, cr I broached like the third rail of something to say that is this person able to convince swaths of their party to be able to get behind this kind of legislation, whether that's Medicare for all, whether that is the pa passing of a minimum wage law. I think that there are just political realities that we need to accept. And in that way, that's how I think consider who is the best person to lead the party? But how did you kind of balance that? Is that something that you thought about when you were campaigning? Is that there are certain things that are feasible and there are just certain things that aren't? Well, I think I, I don't think it's static. I think that what somebody campaigns on can build a an election mandate to then compel the Congress to do what they campaigned on. I think we have had campaigns like that in the past in which the um, the candidate has not followed through in trying that. And I think that's why, I think that in part, that's why the social contract has been torn apart. To be specific about it, I think you saw 
you know, back and I, the you, the royal you, we saw the. I'm reading a book right now called Winter War about um, FDR winning and how much uh, the, the 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 difficult transition between Hoover and FDR, and it's a lot of it is about how FDR campaigned on what were then radical ideas, and he did try to follow through on them, and he did build enough election. You know, there was there was the 32 election, then of course the midterms and the 36 election, and his theory was if I keep winning elections based on an agenda, I will end up forcing that agenda into passage, right? It will ultimately trickle down into my party having to do what I'm campaigning and winning elections on. I think, unfortunately, in the modern era, we have seen uh, Democratic presidents, uh, especially I, I think a lot about Obama, raising the prospect of lots and th lots of things are going to happen, campaigning in a sense like FDR campaigned, and then immediately refusing to even try to implement uh, a large, broad, sweeping agenda. And I think when people watched that, it shredded the social contract, it shredded the expectation, it shredded people's uh, faith that campaigns mattered much, that anything matters much, and thus created the conditions for the Joker, Donald Trump, right? Like, yeah. the, And I mean like the Joker, not ha-ha. I'm talking about like, you know, people who've watched the movie The Joker or Joker, I guess not called The Joker, but Joker, the modern movie, you know, Joker, sort of Joker politics. Nothing matters. No matter what I say, it doesn't, no matter what my opponent says, no matter what anybody in the political arena says, it's all bullshit. So just vote for me to blow up the system. So I think vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, campaigns, I think we have gotten so used to candidates campaigning on promises and then abandoning those promises that there's actually not nearly as much outrage for abandoning those promises because it's been normalized, because we've gotten used to that. And I think, I think that's sown... Again, the conditions for Donald Trump to succeed. Now, again, I keep going back to when I think about this election, I keep going back to what do I want the day after the election? What do I want? Do I want a stronger Democratic Party political machine to be able to say, everyone shut the fuck up. The only thing that matters is stopping Donald Trump. If you're pressuring the Democrats to do anything, you are making an alliance with Donald Trump. Do I want that outcome or do I want the outcome the day after the election where different governors, different Congress people are thinking about running for president and are starting to tout a much more uh, populist, progressive agenda and trying to court different pieces of the party to build a coalition to become the next president after Joe Biden based on that. That's the outcome I want. I can't think of a time that we've had that. Maybe I guess you could argue 2008 between Obama and Clinton, where I do think that debate was actually really healthy, really good. I mean, Obama didn't follow through on what he, I mean, he, I, I mean, I, I may be the only person in America willing to say this, but I think Don, uh, Barack Obama created the conditions for Donald Trump. I think that. Uh, I, I think it's almost. I think, I, I think there's. Well, yeah, no, I mean, the, the, I, you're I not allowed to say it out loud in, in polite company, <laughs> but but I think that's in, entirely true. Well, and, I and, was of that generation. I, I was in high school in 2008. And I remember hope, change, everything. Yeah, this is great. And I do think that that's why a lot of millennials, particularly right now, are so upset with what they see in their political reality is because the campaign was premised on being such a radical change. The campaign slogan was literally change. And if you were just casually paying attention or you were young and you didn't really kind of understand the whole limits of the system, you were promised that this is going to be one of the most transformational things in history, that this is such a sea change from George W. Bush, who for millennials was the president basically their whole life. And then you saw 
a continuation of the wars. You saw a compromise. Let's work with the Tea Party. Let's work with, you know, my opponents. And this is very high minded politics, but I think you're completely right. I think that most people watching that said, where is the change and where is the transformation that I, I was promised? And I do think that is why now you do see a lot of people grappling with what does my vote actually mean and what does it actually matter? I think not one thing to answer, one of the questions here that says, um, you know, in other words, is 2028, is, go is it going to be an open Democratic Party race regardless? In fact, Trump winning is the only thing that guarantees that. What I would say about the world and especially politics is nothing is a guarantee. There's nothing that you can guarantee is going to happen as much as you game out a scenario. And that's the accelerationist kind of thing. Right, right, right. Though, it, but, but I think Trump winning, yes, there will be an open Democratic primary in 2028 if Trump wins. But that means that the entire 2028 Democratic presidential primary will be about Trump. It will literally be about be Trump. About Trump. Yeah. I, I worked in that 2020 primary. One of the most destructive, suppressive um, uh, aspects of the 2020 Democratic primary, as compared, by the way, to the 2016 Democratic primary, was that Trump overlaid everything in the 2020 Democratic primary, that mm -hmm. there was an, a hesitation among every candidate to actually have an honest conversation a vigorous debate to go after one another over important issues because infused into the media, infused into the political class, infused into the activist class, infused into the rank and file Democratic voters thinking was any vigorous debate weakens the party's ability to ultimately defeat Trump. It was incredibly distortive. It was incredibly, that, that, that way of thinking is incredibly destructive. And what I'm hoping for is a 2028 presidential contest where that's gone, where there can actually be an uninhibited uh, competition for the base voter of the Democratic Party. And we haven't had that. It, un, I mean, it's not to say we've never had that. 2008, there was a little bit of that. Uh, and 2016, there was there was that. Uh, yeah. That's why you saw, I thought, you saw Bernie Sanders being much more willing uh, to go after uh, Hillary Clinton than Bernie Sanders was willing to go after Joe Biden. And I was right there having arguments with Bernie Sanders about how he had to go draw a much sharper contrast with Joe Biden. And the hesitation was not just from him, but from the a lot of the apparatus around him and from a lot of uh, voters, certainly from a lot of the Democratic consulting class was, you can't draw a sharp contrast with Joe Biden because that's only going to, if Joe Biden ends up being the nominee, that's only going to weaken him in a battle to unseat Trump. I mean, I think that that whole theory is horseshit. Yeah, I think it's complete garbage, right? That I that I don't think there's much evidence for the for the fact that a vigorous open seat primary. I don't think there's any evidence at all that a vigorous open seat primary weakens the ultimate nominee uh, for the general election. I mean, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama ripped each other's face off in 2008. I mean, they destroyed each other, and Barack Obama won a huge a huge election victory. So I, think I also that, think that's how we got here right now with the state of the unpopularity of Joe Biden. For one, a primary forces you out onto the campaign trail you have absolutely to but as you said it, it battle tests you and so i think so many voters feel like where was our voice to even say this is what we want to push for to the point that so many people in primaries just said we'll just vote uncommitted is that what it's going to take to send this guy a message and I do think that if there was a more real primary, you did have Marion Williamson and Dean Phillips. I think if there was even at least just one debate between Joe Biden and Dean Phillips and Marion Williamson, he might have actually not assuaged people, but maybe put some people to rest to say, look, fine, we went through it. We were able to get a, a primary and the guy still won. And you can pick apart all the reasons that 
that a lot that you know being the nominee and having the party behind you leads to that but at least people might have felt a little bit better and saying whatever we got our chance to try now you basically skipped over the primary you don't really hear a lot from this guy on the campaign trail and he just goes out there and we don't really have a sense of what energizes the base of voters what messaging works and what's not but also i think you know something about joe biden that a lot of progressives, you know, we've broke on on the show not too long ago, have credited is that he has been pushed on issues. And, to, you know, I think it should be stated that there are a handful of things that Joe Biden was far more conservative on. He did end up going bigger. It's not perfect, you know, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to make the sale for Joe Biden, but I do understand that strategic point that you could push Joe Biden. This time, I think that is where a lot of the discontent is, whether it be on Gaza, whether it be on taking a much bigger thwack openly against corporations or, you know, the lock of the establishment in the party. People don't feel like they have any means of at least getting a concession or pressuring them without essentially saying, we might not vote for you. And that's kind of what gets us into this fraught sort of uh, thing here. So all that's to say is I completely agree with you. And I think that the lack of a primary has been incredibly detrimental to Absolutely. this campaign. A hundred percent. The lack of a Democratic primary. I mean, it's not just detrimental to his campaign. It's detrimental to the Democratic Party. It's frankly, it's detrimental to democracy. And it's a sad commentary on the state of the Democratic Party. It. it it, you and we did a podcast about this uh, yeah. an episode of Lever Time, which was, which asked the question: How is it that there are so few, even self-interested, ambitious Democratic politicians, seeing an opportunity for themselves to run in a Democratic, in a, in a Democratic primary? But by, by that I mean, this party is now such a top-down. Uh, ossified party as compared to the past in the past when there were primaries all the time at every level i, mean, I was just listening to a podcast recently uh from wgbh the big dig oh uh, yeah about, yeah, yeah. about and, and one of the episodes is about how michael dukakis faced a primary yep in uh, i think it was 78 and lost a democratic primary for governor he ultimately came back and won a Democratic primary later on to become governor again. And it was like, wow, it's 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 actually hard to imagine a Democratic Party in which even at the gubernatorial level, much less the presidential level, that that there that primaries were like a thing, like a normal part of democracy. Right. I mean, it's incredible to me that people that that people at a national stature, governors, senators, Congress people. All of them, presumably ambitious politicians at some level, looked at the state of the presidential race and said, you know what, I'm going to take a pass. Like that is a, an incredible commentary on the lack of ambition and how ossified the Democratic Party really is. And so I would argue, to bring it back to the central question about voting in 2024, I would argue that if you think the ossification and the corruption of the Democratic Party machine is a major problem in politics, not just a minor problem, a huge problem. That's where I come down. I think it's one of the big problems in our country's politics right now, that you have a Democratic Party that basically doesn't have democracy in it. Okay, That's one of the problems in America. If you think that's one of the problems in America, and you're willing to acknowledge that Donald Trump won't be better on any policy that you care about than Joe Biden, then I think you should factor that into your decision to how you, how you vote. I think that's something you, you should think about. And I know I've seen some of these questions saying, you know, uh, Joe Biden supports genocide, Joe Biden this, Joe Biden that. I don't I don't dispute any of I don't dispute the criticism of Biden's foreign policy. I don't dispute the 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 substantive criticism out there. I'm looking at outcomes. What outcome do I think is most realistic? And also, obviously, this other question of, especially for uh, the, the so-called accelerationist argument, oh, things have to get worse before they get better, right? 
I think that's a highly privileged thing to assert in this way. It, it, it's kind of triggering for me because I've heard people say that, you know, things have to get better before they get worse. So Trump winning, yeah, things will be bad, but that'll like radicalize everybody so that things will be better mm -hmm. on the other side. How privileged do you have to be to just sort of elide four years of destruction on climate policy, on economic policy, on foreign policy? Like how, how, how great and insulated from the real world must your life be to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to kick back, have four years of just burning everything down because which on the other side, do. which we did do, and it yeah. wasn't great, right? Like how fucking privileged are you to say we got my excel, my my accelerationist theory, right? It's just a theory. My accelerationist theory means it's fine for shit to just get burnt all the way to the ground with all the death and destruction that will cause, because at the end of the day, at the end of that, it offers a better chance that people will be in such vicious pain that they'll decide to do uh, the right thing then. I mean, I, I just think that's like, a, it's like a sociopathic argument that I can't even take seriously. Yeah, so I wanna get to some of the questions that we have here and, you know, apologies if we haven't been saying your names exactly a lot, but we are we are seeing these, we're trying to incorporate them. So Chuck Ginsburg, I'm gonna kind of roll both of these that you've asked into one. So one of your questions is, why haven't we discussed RFK Jr.? What are our thoughts on that? I will give you that in just one second. Your other question is, is it a lack of ambition that no one wanted to compete with Biden or was it the DNC that dictated Biden was their man? So that was actually the premise of uh, one of our first episodes of the relaunch of Lever Time. You know, without getting into the exact rooms where conversations were happening with people like Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro or Gavin Newsom from California, I think it is very clear that the media and, frankly, members of the Democratic Party were openly saying there are stronger candidates we think could run. There are younger candidates. There are people who can create a bigger coalition. So I don't think it's for a lack of ambition. I mean, you don't get to become the governor of an entire state if you're not an ambitious person. Uh, you don't. No, 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 wait a minute. Wait, I'm going to dispute that. OK, and. Uh, I think that most Democratic politicians today have have learned and or come up through a system of compliance to get where they mm -hmm. are. Right. And that their method of getting where they are is to play by the top down rules, that there yep. are not a lot of of politicians in the Democratic Party at any level who uh, crashed the gate. There are very few who crash the gate. So if you have come up in politics uh, carefully appeasing the top, then you are highly unlikely ever to try to violate that top-down system uh, for fear of being uh, marginal. Like if you, it, you know, it's the old idea: if you come for the king, you best not miss. Right? That right. knowing that if you miss you're you're done like your career is over and i think the difference is is that we there was a world in the not so distant past where you could run in a primary and still if you didn't win you would still remain relatively relevant you you yeah. you, you could do that in a way that it wasn't perceived as a crime against the party right i mean i i'm not idealizing this but one example like ted kennedy ran for president against a very weak Jimmy Carter. He did not win the primary. Uh, uh, he didn't win the primary for a lot, lots of reasons, including reasons of his own, of his own, you know, errors and failings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some people have blamed Carter's loss on Ted Kennedy's primary. I see no evidence for that. Uh, I think Jimmy Carter did a hell of a job losing that race himself. We won't debate that. But my point is, is that Ted Kennedy remained Ted Kennedy after that. He wasn't uh, banished from the party he wasn't considered some sort of political criminal for having run a primary. I do think the dynamic has now changed, that the dynamic now is most of the politicians who were in office at a national level in the Democratic Party came up by kissing the ring and also know that if they ever tried to jump out of that order or, vi or didn't respect those top-down rules, it, they would be 
they would face real consequences. Yeah. And so did the second part of your question, Chuck, did the DNC dictate that Biden was their man? Look, I don't know of, of, of a, a smoking gun email or a memo that went around. What I do think is very apparent is that multiple heads of state Democratic parties really put their thumb on the levers to keep names off the ballot, in Florida's case, to cancel a primary, in North Carolina's case, to keep someone like Dean Phillips or Marion Williamson off the ballots. So can I say confidently there was an internal DNC push to keep Biden as the nominee and protect him? I, I think we can say presumably. Presumably, because it, or it would be a very odd coincidence that multiple heads of state Democratic parties all decided, you know what? We're just not going to put other people's names on the ballots. Chuck, you're right. I mean, I mean, the other thing is, the other thing is, before we get to RFK, the other thing is, is that like the DNC and the Biden White House are effectively one and the same. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like you're, you're, together, it's, coordinated it's, the, committees. It's, the, it's the same. Like it's it's asking whether like did the DNC help get Biden to be the, you know, the unchallenged nominee? It's like, did Joe Biden get Joe Biden to be the unchallenged? It's the same. It's the same blob. Right. right? There's no there's not a difference there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you do hear that even from DNC officials who have said Biden is the leader of the Democratic Party, exactly. therefore he is the incumbent. So I, I think there's that. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., look, I think Robert F. Kennedy Jr., if I will be completely honest, and I have watched many of his interviews, I have read a lot of his statements, I think Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is really an anti-establishment figure who has a couple unorthodox positions. He's taken a different tack on vaccines. He's more comfortable, you know, looking at things like institutional capture. But for the most part, I tend to see a pretty standard cut and dry Democrat. I, I think the way he packages himself is different. And I think that he breaks a couple shibboleths, uh, particularly in, you know, to his credit, he does talk about the influence of corporate power. But when it comes to things like his Israel policy, and frankly, even when it comes to things like how he would address student loan debt, the economy, I, I don't really feel that RFK Jr. is that much of a break from much of the a lot of what you've seen already come out of the Democratic Party. He himself is just a kind of interesting, different figure. I think his rawness is something that is really what makes him stand out, is his ability to just be happy saying on an interview, I don't know, I need to look into this. I see that as a thing people are getting attracted to, but I don't, I don't consider him to be as iconoclastic or as radical as sometimes the portrayal of RFK Jr. can get. He's from a legacy Democratic political family. He believes in much of what the party is doing. I think, again, there are a couple of things that, yes, he has said uh, in matters of war, he would like to roll back the, you know, the U.S. military state. Again, a lot of political candidates running for office, Barack Obama had also said similar things. And you see in somewhere like the Israel-Gaza situation, he doesn't, seem to agree that that should go there so that i do i think with rfk jr he's really just more of an interesting character but i don't know if he's representing such a paradigm shift from what we've already seen come out of the democratic party i mean my take on robert f kennedy is that first of all i'm not convinced how much of a factor he's going to be but perhaps yeah. in, in some places he might my own personal opinion on him is that he's had a very laudable career as an environmental advocate, uh, I've been on his was on his radio show. Uh, oh, Ring times. of Fire. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll also say I've been pretty disturbed about his sudden downplaying of the of the climate crisis and climate policy during his campaign, and I think it's likely because he knows it might offend conservative voters that he's trying to court. So I've been like, it, like I've been particularly kind of disturbed by a guy who knows better who has been an environmental advocate all of a sudden being like, yeah, I'm, you know, climate's not a big priority for me. Like that suggests a level of, uh, it, it just suggests a level of instability or inconsistency mm -hmm. that's just like, it was his issue. So the, the minute yeah. he gets into the actual political arena and he sees that, that, that fighting for that issue might be a little bit complicated, he's like, yeah, I'm out. Like I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Like that—that's not good. 
Yeah. That's especially not good for a candidate who's holding himself out there as like a like a voice of truth, like a principled voice of truth. I've also been disturbed by some of the things that he said uh, about vaccines. Yeah. I mean, I just I, I just think like I'm not saying questions can't be raised about, you know, how vaccines come into process and are they are they tested, et cetera, et cetera. But he said some pretty out there shit about vaccines. And anybody who denies that is fucking lying like he said some crazy shit about vaccines he was asked point blank on a podcast name one good thing about vaccines if you think you're if you say you're not an anti-vaxxer and he couldn't he didn't answer the question he refused to not refused to saying i won't answer the question he said i i can't think of it and then he said if you think any vaccine is truly safe i don't agree with that that is a patently anti-vaccine yeah so i think he said some crazy (laughs) shit about vaccines and i also say this I generally don't like the idea of presidential candidates of any party whose candidacies are largely built on celebrity rather mm-hmm. than experience in government. And and let let's I mean maybe this makes me old fashioned or something but I don't think being president is just a celebrity position. It's a real job that you probably should have some experience or related experience in in government it's a big government job i think the trend of electing presidents with almost no executive experience in government has been bad trump yeah. is the most egregious example of this being you know a guy who has i mean you could say he has corporate executive experience like sort of running i think the, that's even being generous yeah, i mean like like sort of he has no experience running any kind of public entity. And by the way, Obama had barely been in the U.S. Senate, had zero executive experience running any large public entity. That wasn't a great presidency either. And it's the same thing for somebody like RFK Jr. And who, it's worth adding, if we're going to be really honest, is only even in this race because of his name. If his name was Joe Schmo, he wouldn't be any kind of factor at all. And if you can't admit that, again, you're fucking lying to yourself. Like, do you think Joe Schmo, who was the same exact person as RFK uh, Jr., who was named Joe Schmo, would get nearly any of the attention as RFK Jr.? It's not to say that, like, that's his fault, right? He was, he, he is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. My point, though, is that it is kind of a celebrity ish or at least name ID candidacy. Yeah, that's why he had his platform. He's exactly. a Kennedy son. That's also historically his whole career, why he's why the press has listened to him, why he's been able to get magazine articles. Right. Uh, and maybe I'm is, and look, maybe dynamic. I'm howling at the moon, right? I'm howling at the moon in the sense of like I don't want you know presidential contest to be celebrity races. And maybe that's just like I mean, that's just a fact of life. But like I don't I don't think I don't think that's that that's great. And I, I want to go back to I really don't think it's great to elect presidents who have no executive experience in in the public sphere i think that's bad and i i you know maybe you're like maybe people are eye rolling saying well you know get over it like donald trump's in president yeah i thought i think that was bad that was bad so and and i think you know i i go back to i'm not sure how much of a factor robert f kennedy jr is going to be uh and, and again i'm not telling you to vote for him or not vote for him that's just i'm just giving you my sort of thoughts on how yeah. i think of robert f kennedy Yeah, so I think a good continuation is Karen from Portland, Oregon. David has just described the reason for the death of the Democratic Party. Do not be surprised that the next four years, parentheses, no matter who wins, that a third party grows from 2024 through 2028. RFK Jr. should be seen in a congressional hearing of any kind before you consider him. This will encourage you to never vote for the man. Um, So I will say he was actually in a congressional hearing uh, not too long ago. So if people want to look up that video. Um, do not be surprised that a third party grows from 2024 through 2028. I look, I, I will be honest and maybe, you know, even in my thirties, I'm starting to get cynical about this. This is like every election. I feel like there has been this, you know, the establishment candidate has, has not done quite the things. And there's always this thing that says, look, eventually a third party is going to mobilize. It's going to get bigger. It's going to do that on at least the presidential level. I don't know how realistic that is. Part of it is, I think, because a lot of third parties only focus on the presidential race. Building a party 
The Democratic Party, the Republican Party, is a giant umbrella of state-affiliated organizations who are doing a ton of work. As much as you know, it is dictated from the top down, you have local offices that are printing out flyers, organizing volunteers, knocking on doors, basically putting out there, look how many people are in this party or these are the two choices. Third parties to me just don't they're not doing that whether it's the everyone want look every I everyone wants a shortcut. Yeah. This is the thing this is not, and this is me at age 48 the old man that I am having I, I sound like a crotchety old uncle but I think in every sphere of American culture everyone is looking for an easy shortcut whether it's in media building media organizations, whether it's in politics, whether it's in business, everyone is looking for a cheap, easy shortcut. And I'm here to tell you that cheap, easy shortcuts don't exist. That the idea of a actually grassroots, populist, uh, third party connected to real people can start at the highest, most isolated part of the political system, the presidential level, without taking the time and the hard work to actually build those part th those parties in local communities, in states, mm -hmm. is absurd. But it's classically American. Everyone wants a get-rich-quick scheme. Everyone wants a shortcut. They don't fucking exist. And, you know, we've seen third parties... In some states, I mean, you saw the Progressive Party in Vermont. You saw the Working Families Party use uh, fusion voting in places like uh, New York. Uh, uh, it hasn't done nearly enough. And the two major parties have done whatever they can to squelch that down. But if, you, if you're interested in third parties, stop thinking about the presidential race. Start thinking about your own local community. I know it's not as sexy. It's not as glamorous. It doesn't give you a sense that you're going to change the world overnight. But the world doesn't change overnight when it comes to American politics. Yeah. By the way, I, I, I want to reiterate because I'm because that's going to get taken out of context. <laughs> if you want to vote third party in the presidential election, have at it. I'm not here to tell you how to vote. Well, I think that is exactly the, the theme of what we're talking about tonight. We're talking really in terms of strategy i mean again your vote is your vote but you ostensibly want your vote to go go towards something i do think if you want a third party candidate to grow between 24 and 28 i would work on the local level but organizing is difficult and you know raising that kind of money can also be difficult so those are just the reasons why i don't think a third party is really necessarily going to run also um, also i want to bring up I'm gonna, let's do some rapid fire questions here pete yeah, pete, yeah. Writes in Clinton, Obama, uh, oh, Clinton and Obama both lost Democratic primaries. That is true. If Biden wins, regardless of the views of her, there's a good chance that Harris could be running as president. Look, I think Kamala Harris will run for president uh, because that's what vice presidents tend to do. I, I would take it a step further. I think there's a chance that Kamala Harris becomes president because I don't think Joe Biden is looking very good. I think that the, the, the craziest part of the entire oh, like election in a second term becomes the yeah, president. Yeah, yeah. No, no. The craziest part of this entire election is is, is that there. Like, I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm not trying to be predictive. I'm just like, you know, on an actuarial table, there's a good chance that Donald Trump or Joe Biden die in office. Like that's like just actuarial table data here, statement of fact. So I think there's a, a decent chance that Kamala Harris is the president, and. I think that's an unbelievable disaster for the Democratic Party in 2028. And I think there's a situation in which Kamala Harris is the appoint, essentially the, the not appointed president, but, but the successor president, becomes president sometime in Biden's second term. Uh, and then there isn't a contested, vigorous Democratic party. I could see that playing out. But I want to underscore could. I still am not convinced that Kamala Harris is perceived within the Democratic Party, even within the Democratic Party elite, yeah. as, as strong enough a candidate, as skilled enough a candidate to squelch down and to crush, to say, 
you know, the governor of Pennsylvania, the governor of Michigan, uh, this senator, that senator can't, shouldn't, must not be allowed to run against them. I, I just don't think she's earned that space in the Democratic Party. Yeah. So, but, but, but I certainly could see that. I certainly could see that, you know, it's 2026. Kamala Harris is now president. Like what happens to 2028? I mean, and, and it does raise, it does raise an interesting question because look, you know, if, if, if you believe that Donald Trump is an existential threat to the United States of America, and yet you are also like, let's renominate a wildly unpopular 81 year old incumbent. Like there's a little bit of tension there, isn't there? Like, Donald Trump is an existential threat to the entire United States and to the world. He must be stopped. That's one message from the Democratic Party elite. And the way to stop him is we just we just must renominate an 81 year old, historically unpopular incumbent. Like, well, which is it? Is it like Donald Trump is so dangerous that we need to do everything we can to stop him? Or is the priority just deference to the dear leader? Right. Because I think if you're if you care about defeating Donald Trump. If you if you sincerely are worried that Donald Trump is the worst threat to the to the United States and the world, as the Democratic Party pur purports to believe in its advertisements, then you would have thought that the same Democratic Party would be like, hey, you know what, maybe we should find a stronger nominee. Maybe maybe the 81 year old, wildly unpopular incumbent is not the best guarantee to stop the thing that we're saying is the existential threat, which then, of course, if you, you know, you take those two those two thoughts together, you're like, wait a minute, maybe there are parts of the Democratic Party that don't mind if Donald Trump wins, which goes back to my theory, which is that I think the top of the Democratic Party knows that it will be just fine when if Donald Trump wins, not only fine that they will be able to continue their grift. If you are a Democratic consultant right now and you're making a lot of money on TV ads, if you are a Democratic uh, Party official right now uh, and you've got a, a, a good high paying job at the DNC or whatever, you know that if Donald Trump's president, the next four years, just you sending out emails saying, give us money to stop Donald Trump. Yeah. You know your job is way easier in 20 in 20 the day after the election if Donald Trump wins, way easier than if the day after the election Joe Biden is president and there are seven candidates running for president in 2028. Want to yeah, do a couple I more think, questions? Yeah, let's do it. Are there any ones that are standing out to you? Um let's so, see. Uh Patrick Patrick's question right here. Patrick, you say, I am engaged in ballot initiatives in Michigan. It helps drive turnout for Dems. We've lost relationships that build political ties and targeting our base. This is technocratic and managerial corporate style politics. It is funded by wealthy donors. It follows best business practices. This style of politics attends to elite concerns of companies, corporate agendas, concerns of higher wealth individuals. It's plutocracy stuff. In Michigan, we are doing grassroots work to build power. So look, I, I'll say right off the bat, Patrick, I don't think you're wrong. And I think if you follow the work we do here at The Lever, we are trying to expose every single one of those things. And we're trying our hardest to do it. What I'll also say is that you're a grassroots organizer in Michigan working on ballot initiatives. Dude, you've, like, to your credit, you've pushed this party. And I know it doesn't feel like it does. And it can feel like you're getting constantly slapped in the face. But people like you, you're the reason the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is going after credit card companies. You're the reason Joe Biden's former chief of staff, Ron Klain, met extensively with the Congressional Progressive Caucus. You're the reason he tried to go with the biggest version of Build Back Better rather than the more scaled down one, which was originally where he started at. So, you know, I I, I agree with everything that you, you say in this, this statement or, or this question. I guess all I would say in response to it is um, people like you are making a difference. And I know it's not enough of a difference. It doesn't feel like a difference. But that is how I have seen some of the things coming from this administration. We've talked about on Lever Time. There are some positive economic things that have come out, some of the best economic policies I, I, in 50 I, years. I, I think that can't be. I mean, I know one of the things that I find most annoying about the discourse around this uh, 
not just around this uh, this uh, this election, but the way we talk to each other in this country, or at least the way people who follow politics talk to each other is, if you say something good about a, a candidate, it must mean you love that candidate and think they are perfect. If you say yeah. something bad about the other candidate, it must mean you love their opponent. Like, I guess what I'm saying is statements can't exist unto themselves, right? So, but but I think that's all a preface to say, I do think it is undeniable, and I have written this, and I have been shit on by leftists for writing this, that Joe Biden's economic policies have been the best policies in 50 plus years. I think I think that statement stands on its own. It's not particularly close, to be quite honest. The American Rescue Plan was the best economic policy that I have seen in my entire lifetime since at least I've been conscious as a, a person, right? A massive investment in the working class of this country. What the CFPB and the FTC are doing is by far the best regulatory policy that has happened in 50 plus years. Yeah. Now, I want to caveat that again by saying it's also true that the last 50 years have had horrifically shitty presidents who have been horrible. So the bar is unbelievably low. It's also to say that what Biden's economic policy has done, nonetheless, has been inadequate to the economy that we are dealing with. So multiple things can be true at the same time. People can be rightly unhappy with the way the economy functions, that they're not ingrates. They're not stupid for being unhappy with the economy in a, the richest country in the world that has sh a shitty healthcare bureaucracy that's designed to ration healthcare with housing costs out of control, with uh, uh, inflation for groceries and necessities out of control. Like you're right to be on, people are right to be unhappy with, with the economy. But it also can be true that the last four years have been the best economic policies that we've seen in 50 years and far better than anything Donald Trump is proposing uh, or did. As president, the, the I think the, the problem with, I don't know why it takes courage. Like I, I'm, I'm like getting nervous just saying that because I know I go, oh, Sirota's just shilling for Joe Biden. Or, you know, he's just saying Biden's, Biden's great. I'm not saying Biden is perfect or great. There's plenty to criticize Biden about. But I think if you can't acknowledge what I just said, if somehow you think acknowledging it means you're giving Joe Biden a pass on everything else, like you've lost your fucking mind. You're part of the problem in not being able to have an honest discussion about any of this. So to be honest, I'll just level with people. Everyone here is a paying lever subscriber. The reason I, there was like a few hours before this event, I was like, I don't want to fucking do this event. I don't want to do this event. I don't, I don't want, because like nobody can have a rational discussion about anything. Anything I say is going to be like, you know, uh, extracted, criticized, you know, taken, taken out of context to suggest, I believe things that I don't believe. And it's not, I'm, it's not about me. It's about like the whole discourse is like this. So I didn't want to do this, uh, this event because of that, because I'm sick and tired of talking about this shit with, because it, because very few people can have a normal conversation that acknowledges conflicting truths or, or not even conflicting truths. The idea that many things can be true at the same time. Right? Yeah, many things can be true at the same time, which generate different and opposing feelings. And we all have to take these many things that are true at the same time and ultimately decide how to politically engage with them. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I think especially in spaces like this, we need to presume good faith, not bad faith. That that's that's actually my main lament. And I know I sound like an old crotchety old man, but like. This notion that everybody who says anything, that what they say must be, you must have the worst take on it. You must presume the worst intentions is is part of why we're we're at this hor horrible moment in history. Yeah. I also think, you know, and what you were doing is that you weren't standing Joe Biden. You were recognizing the work of like the person, Patrick, the grassroots organizer, you are acknowledging the power of that work. And I think that that is something that I 
I don't think it's sure. healthy to get overcome with with cynicism and despair as much as I personally feel it, as much as I mean, we spend our entire day talking about crappy things happening in the entire world. I do think that you have to have a reason for hope. You have to have a reason. You have to re- have a reason to keep going. And when things are put into these kind of bad faith binaries, as you were describing, I think that ultimately leads to people like Trump or corporate power winning because they have completely burnt you out. They have crushed it, it, that's you. A, that's it, it is 1984. You that's know, exactly there's no right. hope. That's exactly so just right. And, and I join think you're our right. system and forget it. And 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 the, the the corrective that I take from what you just said, Arjun, is that Biden having the best economic policies in 50 years, even though they are they are still inadequate to the economic challenges that we face, even though the bar is low. Because the past presidents, their policies have been so bad, Biden having the best economic policies in 50 years is not. As much a credit to Joe Biden as it is to the fact that that he was forced to take those positions. Yeah. Joe Biden was a conservative corporate Democrat for 30, really 40 years. The good economic policy that has come out of his administration is because you can credit Joe Biden for one thing, one one skill that Joe Biden has. It really it may only be one skill. <laughs> like he may not have any other skills other than this. Okay, Joe Biden's one skill is that he knows where the center, and I mean the popular center, not the elite center. He knows where the center of the Democratic electorate is, and he puts himself right there, maybe one slight click to the right of the center of the rank and file Democratic Party and the work to move that center to a more progressive set of positions, especially on economics, was work that will never be fully recognized, will never be fully honored on a person-by-person level, but that is the work of years and years of grassroots organizing, of electing Mm -hmm. people at the local level, at the state level, right? Like, So the credit you can give to Joe Biden is, that he knows that his skill is he knows where the center of the rank and file Democratic Party is. The credit yeah. that you can give to unions and organizers and communities is that that center through decades of work was finally moved. Yeah, that's that. And 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 so what you should want when you think about how to vote in 2024 is, again, I want to for people who are just joining. People want to think they're voting for a person. What you because because we're we're in a followership culture, a celebrity culture, right? I mean, look at the, like Twitter, right? You follow a person, right? Yeah. Like we, we've been taught that we like when we go into the voting booth, we're voting for like a per- and you are voting for a person at one level. But the but the the way to to make it a more dispassionate decision, and again, vote however you want, but the way to make it a more dispassionate decision is to think. I'm trying to vote for an outcome, regardless of who happens to be the person I'm voting for. I'm voting. My vote is a tactic to reach an outcome. Yeah. You can still vote for someone and walk out of the voting booth still saying, fuck that guy. Totally. 100%. Okay. And and I think, you know, it's more if anyone's listening if that's if you feel like he's better than Donald Trump, he's better than Donald Trump. You can still say fuck that guy. I hate the way everything about him. All of this. Let me be clear. There's only been one person that. I've ever voted for who who I who I have nothing bad to say about. There's Michael only one Dukakis. person. There's only one person I've <laughs> gone into the voting booth and voted for who I love unconditionally as a person, I've, and that's my wife. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have voted for my wife, who's a Democratic state legislature, Democratic state legislator. I have voted for her unconditionally. I mean, I have her and I have our differences, but I don't I I love her unconditionally, right? But like short of that, like I haven't cast a vote for anyone who who I don't have differences with. I've never voted for somebody who I think is perfect. In fact, most of my votes I'm voting for people I don't like as people. And I I don't like their 
I don't like their politics because that's what because voting is not an expression of my uh, love for a person. Right. Voting is my my bet, my tactical. And everybody's up, you know, everyone is has a right to how they perceive their tactics. I try to cast my vote by thinking about if I want this outcome, how do I calibrate my vote, regardless of who, which of these people that I am that I hate, I like personally. Just what is the outcome I want? So how do I cast my vote to try to get closer to that outcome? Yeah, absolutely. Um Selena Sweet, you don't really have a question, but I just like uh, Kamala Harris showed her deficits in the chutzpah department when she passed as California Attorney General on nailing Mnuchin for his destructive impact on mortgage holders. I wanted to just read that out because I like the use of the term chutzpah department. I thought that was a good use. Uh, I also want to shout out the book Homewreckers, which is actually exactly what you're talking about here. David, do you know about what happened in California where Steve Mnuchin was, I believe he was... Uh, a stakeholder or even possibly the owner of a company that was basically buying reverse mortgages off of people. Elderly people were tricked into signing these reverse mortgages. Their families were left on the line. And yes, Kamala Harris uh, passed as California attorney general. I think she cut a deal with Mnuchin. Yeah. To not prosecute and there, yes. And there's a great book about it called uh home records that I yeah. uh, encourage yeah, look, everyone I mean, to go check out. I mean, look, Kamala Harris I have a I have a lot of thoughts about Kamala Harris. Uh, it's a whole subject for a whole other live event, or you know, to discuss Kamala Harris. I mean, I am extremely unimpressed with Kamala Harris. I do think being vice president is a difficult job to to sort of uh, uh, distinguish yourself. Uh, it's kind of a weird job. I mean, that's why there was a whole sitcom about it called Veep, which is all about how weird a job uh, <laughs> vice president is. Um, but I think, you know, I, I do think the benefit of Kamala Harris and, and we're going to wrap it up here in a sec. I do think the benefit of Kamala Harris is that at least right now, she is not the presumptive successor to Joe Biden. She probably will run for president. And so I think we're, we're, I want to, I want to end where we, where we started. This is an event about how to think about your vote in 2024. Uh, and I think I want to reiterate this, you know, this point, think about your vote tactically, think about what outcome you want, try to not think about the individual people you're voting for voting against, think about outcomes, and consider the, the fact And I'm not trying to tell you how to vote. But I think it is it is a good bet that Donald Trump becoming president, it, let me let me step back and say this. If you are unhappy with the current Democratic Party's leadership, I think it's worth considering that the best thing for the Democratic Party leadership, the thing that will strengthen them the most, is Donald Trump winning. I, I think it's almost undeniable that they gain more power if Donald Trump wins, more power to control the party, more power to control the discourse with Donald Trump as president, because everything then becomes everyone shut the fuck up and just focus on stopping Donald Trump. That's what the center, the corporate elite bosses of the Democratic Party want. And I think it's also a good bet that if Joe Biden wins the day after the election, the 2028 competition for the Democratic nomination begins, and that the competition will include candidates who are trying to amplify and court the progressive base of the Democratic Party. And that is the kind of competition that you want. That is the kind of competition that can produce or at least has the chance of producing a better overall Democratic Party, a better Democratic nominee. Vigorous, small-D Democratic primaries are a rare thing in the Democratic Party. I believe the fact that they've become so rare 
is the reason why the Democratic Party has been so bad in the current era. And so Joe Biden winning and immediately being a lame duck creates an environment for a little bit more democracy in the Democratic Party. And this says nothing about, again, says nothing about how how much worse Donald Trump's policies, his proposals are, than Joe Biden's current policies and proposals. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned that because, not to downplay it, but, but I think that's undeniably true. But I'm sure yeah. I'm going to be accused of like, you know, shilling for Joe Biden. I mean, if you read the lever, you know, we don't shill for Joe Biden. Like, uh, like, you, you know that I'm not shilling for Joe Biden. I'm just trying to trying to drop some like obvious truths here. So that's that's all I got for everybody. Yeah, uh, I don't think I have much more to tack on to that. No, I think this is a lot of fun event. Thanks for participating, everybody. Yes, let me let me say that. Too. Thank great. you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for for participating. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for being a paid subscriber. Uh, if you like the work that we do, please become I know you're already a paid subscriber, so I'm, I'm not trying to like ask for too much. But like if you really like the work we do, pitch into our tip jar or become a lever leader. We are a reader supported news organization. Your support, we can't, we literally can't do the reporting that we do without your help. So if you want to pitch in, if you like events like this, if you like the work we do, please continue being a paying subscriber. And when you can, pitch in a little more if you can. But either way, thank you so much for your support. Arjun, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. And listen to Lever Time, everybody. Absolutely.